Ivor Cummins. Mr. Cummins, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here in Prague today. And I believe there are some great translators translating what I'm saying, so I'll try not to speak too quickly. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the root causes of heart disease, the primary causes, and how to address them, taking an engineering perspective, because I'm an engineering world complex problem solver who spent five or six years studying this arena. So I am here on behalf of Irish Heart Disease Awareness. Uh, David Bobbitt set up that charity, and they're funding me to get the message out around the world. Uh, the disclosure is, though, that there is no financial ties to the heart imaging industry. So I will speak on certain incredible tests to find out if you have heart disease, uh, but we have no financial ties. This is all philanthropy. So one thing I'm going to talk about is what are big causes of heart disease and chronic disease and what are perhaps lesser causes? You know, have we focused too much on smaller things? And here is a rare bit of footage where we see cholesterol researchers, and you know that for the last 50 years, cholesterol has been a primary cause that's been, billions have been spent and huge resources exploring. But they may not have been noticing so much the data that shows how much more important insulin is in the chronic disease world. So we can get a look at the guys here briefly. Whoa. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> anyway, just a little humor to start you off. So cholesterol is important, but I think uh, a big issue is that we have missed many of the more important things in the heart disease milieu. So the first part is what we say in engineering, if you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. And this is very important. You've got to do the right measurements that speak to cause, that speak to disease most strongly if you're going to be successful in resolving root causes. And I'm going to give an example of contrasting worlds. We see here in the airline industry, they have incredible scanning technology that analyzes components and finds flaws before there is a disaster. And they use it all across the business in investigations. If we look at the heart disease world, there's a scanning technology I'm going to mention to you that is grossly underused and is in itself an incredible technology. So I'll tell you about that. Massive research effort has gone in, in to avoid air disasters with intense root cause investigations, and they've reduced the number of fatalities by a factor of 60 over the last 50 years. And that's in the face of increasing complexity. So it's an extraordinary result. But there's been a lot of research effort got into understanding chronic disease root cause. But cardiovascular disease morbidity and rates are rising. Obesity and diabetes are exploding. Cancer is increasing. So we haven't done quite so well. And finally, for the business of airline, you must find root cause and eliminate it, or your business will fail and your competitor will kill you. So the profit motor remorselessly drives you towards fixing the root causes. You can't patch up the aircraft afterwards. You can't patch up the people. Your business is gone. Whereas in the medical business, unfortunately, and it's not a conspiracy, but the reality is that patching people up and procedures to fix things right after the event is where a huge amount of the profit is. So the profit driver is kind of inverted, right? I want to introduce you to a principle, the Pareto principle, that in engineering is crucial. And essentially what it is, is that if you get your uh, effort into the 20% of the right things to focus on, you'll get 80% of the results. And of course, you absolutely do not want to put 80% of the effort into the things that will get you 20%. So this is the 80-20 rule. And for us, 20% of the root causes for these chronic disease issues, and there is commonality amongst them, account for around 80% of the potential resolution of these problems. And I'm going to touch on them throughout the talk. So this is my supporter, David Bobbitt. He's uh, owner and CEO of a $700 million business. He's a very accomplished man. 
and he was 52 years old a few years ago, super fit, jogging four times a week. He has six children. He's ultra focused on health. And he was described by the doctors as bulletproof. And let's just say he does not get cheap doctors, right? He gets the best. He had a couple of medicals a year, executive medicals, did all the treadmill stress tests, ECGs, all the best stuff, right? And fit as 10% for his age. Bulletproof. But here we'll see the Pareto principle. This calcium scan you can get is around $100. It's a five-minute scan, almost no effort, and it gives a massive payback in data because it sees the disease inside. He happened to get one by coincidence, and he finds out he's a 906, which means he is not bulletproof. He's the worst 1% for his age for cardiovascular disease, multiple blocked arteries, and a 75% chance of a heart attack in the following 10 years. Whereas the risk factors from the Framingham risk calculator said he was 5% or 4%. CAC is huge. He went pretty crazy, to be quite honest, because he's not the type of guy who, who, who wants to find out that there's technology not being used to save people, and he almost went down. So he went ahead, got an angio, multiple brockages. He had no surgery. You don't need surgery in many cases. He got meds and lifestyle fixes, and he researched these lifestyle fixes intensively for six months, took time off his business. He discovered a couple of months later that they hadn't just missed his heart disease in the medical business, they missed the fact that he was a massive diabetic as well. So his blood glucose after a meal, it turned out, was going up to 25 millimoles, or basically several hundred milligrams for uh, American units. But he also discovered that heart disease is resolvable, and if you have really high rates of heart disease, you can take actions that can stop the progression and bring your risk back to someone who never had much heart disease in the first place, and that's important. And nutrition is the primary root cause for this. So he set up the Irish Heart Disease Awareness, funded the Widowmaker movie for a couple of million dollars, no return on his money, uh, and we can send a link to that later. It tells the story of calcification. All philanthropy. So what is this incredible test? Well, here on the left, we see my co-author and buddy, Dr. Jeff Gerber, and he is a zero. There is no calcium in his primary coronary arteries, and that's at the age of 53. And what that means is you have a 15-year warranty as a middle-aged human, because the death rate is so low with a zero score in middle age in the following 15 years, they actually call it a warranty now. Very different story for this guy on the right, this anonymous person. He's probably got six, 700 there at the similar age. That means there's a huge risk for a future heart attack. And remember, this is a five-minute scan. This is not invasive. There's, you know, it's very straightforward. To give you an idea from a recent paper in the imaging journal, Cardiology, you can see there at zero, 1% chance, 1.5 in the next 10 years of having a major cardiovascular event. It's never zero, but that's low. If you look, at a high score like David's, 37% chance of a major event. So that's a 30 times multiplier there between having a low or a high score. Having a high blood pressure might be a two times multiplier or really wacky cholesterol, but this is a 30 times risk multiplier. So you can guess the power. I'll show you one last slide on this. Here we have people with no risk factors, one risk factor, two or three or more. Now, these people, around 50,000 of them were tracked for many, many years, and this is all-cause mortality we're looking at, not just heart attacks. This is the big one, right? You don't want to be in any of those red bars. But you can see with more risk factors, generally, you have more mortality. That's, that's okay. You'd expect that. But what did the bars show? Well, the bars show that they were all scanned for calcification. And that's their calcification scores. And you can see whether you have no risk factors, one, two, or three or more, what dominates in your risk is your calcification score. So that's the test that tells. It ignores all the risk factors. So this is important. Uh, one last thing on it. Uh, what poorly predicts or well predicts the severity of heart disease, the calcification? Because that's the best measure of atherosclerosis and heart disease there is. So here we have higher, higher, super higher calcification going to the right. Now LDL, as it goes up in a person, 
kind of predicts a higher calcification. But then there's guys up here with huge calcification where their LDL is actually low. And this is one of the challenges with things like LDL. You could have a guy down here with a certain LDL and a guy up here with the same LDL. This guy's got no disease, this guy's got massive disease. So it's ambiguous. So it's one of the weaknesses of these measurements. However, if you take blood pressure and diabetes, now you see a dose-response, strong linear relationship, even exponential here, for higher disease with higher levels of these things. And the reason is these are really good reflectors of the underlying dysfunction that causes heart disease. That's why. And they're both actually, those things, reflectors of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance syndrome. And blood pressure, most idiopathic blood pressure, or blood pressure without a known cause, most of it's relating to hyperinsulinemia, if you do the work and study. And of course, diabetes is hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. Okay? And this is applying the Pareto principle. If you focus for the last 50 years on this, you would have been following Pareto, and we wouldn't have the mess we have today. So part two, the primary Paretos. Let's have a look. Here's what we've seen for many decades. You know, the media, the research world, are focusing a lot on cholesterol. Fat's bad, salt's bad, healthy whole grains are good for your heart, wherever they got that. Uh, meat is bad, exercise, blah, blah, blah. That, that's where everyone focuses. But what's missing? Well, what's missing is the poor old elephant, right? And at this stage, the elephant is kind of stuffed into the room. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 20, 30 years ago it was over there, now it's on top of people. And again, the elephant is this problem, this big problem. Not the only problem, but it's the big one. And again, if you follow Pareto, you'd be straight down to talk to the elephant. So here's an example, insulin resistance analyzed by uh, mathematical people and medical people in a team. And they looked at the last 50 years of all the trials on cholesterol and lipids and, and glucose. And they said, let's look mathematically and see from all the measures of risk in the past 50 years, which are the biggest ones? And this is really cool, because these are mathematical guys. They know what they're doing. And they found that insulin resistance is the single most important risk factor for coronary artery disease. No surprises there. But it gets more interesting when you look at their quantitative analysis. And sure enough, for hyperinsulin insulin resistance, you could eliminate 42% of cardiac events if everyone was brought down to a good level. That was their modeling. But what they didn't call out, and they might not realize, is that blood pressure is intimately related to this problem. Low HDL cholesterol is intimately related to hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance. And BMI, in many ways, is strongly related to hyperinsulinemia. So you can nearly look at this whole block here as being pertaining or relating to insulin or insulin dysfunction in its dynamics, which means that's a massive Pareto item. So if you went after that, you'd be certainly following the rule. But what if you went after overwhelmingly, say, LDL cholesterol? They've only got a 16 in here, and the reality is that some of LDL's power in predicting is caused by insulin elevating LDL, cholesterol synthesis. So some of LDL's value is taken from here, from this system. So I'm kind of putting, I'm halving it there. So if you focused on that overwhelmingly, like they did, who, who are they following? This guy? <laughs> Got asked the question. So the elephant, and that's what we're here to talk about today, primarily from here on in. So hyperinsulinemic syndrome, or you may have heard of it as the metabolic syndrome, and this paper is only a couple of years old, it's broader than you think. Well, damn right it is. So this team got 423 papers on metabolic syndrome and disease, right, published scientific studies. And they went through and realized that only 70 of them had measured insulin, which is kind of crazy for metabolic syndrome, which is insulin resistance syndrome, that most teams didn't even measure insulin. But anyway. They measured insulin. Let's see what we get. Let's see how insulin relates to the different diseases. And here's what they found. In the papers that measured insulin, 12 out of 12, 12 out of 13, 15 out of 15, for all these diseases, insulin came up as a key factor in the people who had the disease versus the people who had not. So 
67 out of 70 studies, insulin stood out being higher in the people with the diseases. So it's intimately connected to all of these diseases. A lot of people think it's just diabetes. Well, I'll give you a moment to read all of those. These are all the diseases of modernity, right? And they're essentially unified by connections to insulin. So Gabor later will be talking. He has a lower insulin Facebook group. And that's a great phrase, lower insulin. That's where you need to be. If not many people had this problem, it might not be that bad. However, unfortunately, the majority of US adults published last year are pre-diabetic or diabetic. And European countries are catching up. And pre-diabetic or diabetic is all diabetic to me. Pre-diabetic, diabetic, insulin resistant, hyperinsulinemic, uh, diabetes in situ. Calling them different names confuses things. They're all the same pathology. They're all the esse essential similar problem. And myself and Dr. Gerber reckon, and from his measurements in the last seven years, if you measured the guys with insulin, not just with glucose, properly, maybe 65% of adult Americans are now essentially diabetic. So I let that settle in. Two thirds of your population share a single dysfunction. I don't know, an epidemic is 65% beyond an epidemic? It's crazy in any case, right? So why, how does this come about? Well, interestingly, it has a lot to do with your adipose tissue, your adipocytes. So if you maintain healthy adipose tissue in your body, it is very difficult for your whole body to become hyperinsulinemic or insulin resistant. So healthy fat tissue is very important. If you let your fat tissue get overstrained and it becomes inflamed and enlarged cells, that's where you start the cascade into systemic body-wide insulin resistance. So I'll explain a little of this. You've got safe fat, subcutaneous adipose tissue, legs, buttocks generally, and around the body. And you've got sick fat, primarily in your viscera, behind the muscle wall, in and around your organs. You can see them on MRI, but not many people get MRIs. But here's your subcutaneous all around the outside, and your visceral in around your organs. And you can be a big fat person with very little visceral and with no real issues. And you can be an apparently slim person with a lot of visceral and a huge risk for disease. So I'll show you that now. Which type of person are you? Top left, metabolically healthy, normal weight. Okay, These guys are insulin sensitive. They are very low risk for disease, very low risk. They've got primarily subcutaneous adipose tissue that's in good health. And any bad food or excessive food they eat occasionally, that acts as a shield and a buffer and their liver is protected. They're healthy people. They're the people who live long. Metabolically obese normal weight. These are not big obese people, but they got a problem. They've developed visceral adipose tissue. They've overstrained their ability of their adipose tissue to protect them, and the bullets get through to the liver, the pancreas, and the rest of their system. And they are high risk, and essentially, those people, there's millions of them in the US and all over the world, and they're the tofies, thin outside, fat inside, and everyone wonders why some very obese people are, live a long time and they're healthy, and yet some slim people who don't smoke get a massive heart attack. It's not such a mystery. You need to look at their adipose tissue and you'll find out. So anyway, we're on to our classic person here, metabolically unhealthy obese, huge uh, person, tons of subcutaneous fat obviously all over them, and they got a lot of visceral that's inflamed. And they are high risk also, very high risk. And these guys, really interesting, metabolically healthy obese. So these guys are very heavy, massive, but they mostly have subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it's not inflamed. And they've been able to expand their fat tissue safely. And they have remarkably low risk for disease in the following years. So this is part of the par paradox of weight versus risk, and they can never work it out. It's because of this. Okay. These guys, myself, David, and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness are most concerned about. Guys and gals who are not hugely overweight and therefore will know that they've got risk, but, but they're walking around with high risk without realizing it. And going from Lustig's figures, there could be 50 million adults in this box in the US out of 250 million. That's a lot of people. So when you hear about someone who's not overweight and they have a heart attack, they never smoked, 
you know, this is what we're talking about. These people need warning, and CAC is one way they can get the warning. So part three, some rudiments of root cause, and I'm going to show a root cause diagram that we love using in engineering. And I don't think you'll love it as much, but hopefully you won't hate it, right? We'll have a look. So our problem is, in this case, blood clotting and endothelial damage and inflammation. That's primarily what causes the vascular uh, issues that lead to coronary heart artery disease and, and heart disease. So that, that's our problem. So let's see, can we work through a path to get to that problem? So I'm picking one cause, excess fructose and excess glucose together. Excessive carb in the diet, excessive fructose, sugars, right? That's one cause, but it's only one. Let's go through it. You'll get elevations in GIP and reductions in GLP-1, two gut hormones, the ratio between which is very important. And Gabor is going to go into great detail on this in an hour or two. I'm just going to touch on it. You lead ultimately to adipocyte hypertrophy. So your personal fat threshold of how much you can make new fat cells to safely store energy, you reach your personal limit. And that will depend on genetics and, and other factors. But your individual adipocytes begin to swell bigger than they ought to. And when they begin to swell, the insulin signaling within the adipocyte cell breaks down. When that breaks down, your whole body is heading for the wall, basically. That's the earliest stage. Um, so you get bad adipose tissue. Hyperinsulin becomes a part of life at this point. Now, with this adipocyte hypertrophy and hyperinsulin, you get a lowering of adiponectin, which is a fat cell released, very beneficial hormone that manages your systemic kind of uh, hormonal balance. And it, it works with muscle and liver and all over the place. Very important to have it high. That begins to tank and drop down. You get immune responses, IL-1 beta and lots of other immune responses that, that cause issues within the adipose tissue as they try to fix this problem, and they cause systemic inflammation. Triglyceride trafficking, your LDL, your lipoproteins that carry your cholesterol and your triglyceride for energy around your body, that system gets shot to hell, right? And visceral adipose tissue, we mentioned earlier, begins to expand as a secondary shield to try and deal with the problem you've created. You've created, okay? And you go towards liver and systemic hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance across the body. Raised insulin has mechanisms directly into destroying arteries, incorporating glucose and lipids in the artery wall, causing inflammatory processes. That's a direct mechanistic driver. Raised blood pressure is accepted to be mechanistically driving, drives heart disease through strain on the blood vessels. So that's another mechanism. You've got elevated glucose in this world, particularly as you move down the path. You get glycation, cellular damage, ages, rages, accelerated glycation end products. There's a whole miasma of damage to your vasculature when you're pushing high glucose as well as high insulin. And you've got atherogenic dyslipidemia, the low HDL, the high VLDL, the high particle counts of LDL, all the atherogenic cholesterol stuff is driven mercilessly by being in this state. And that's why a lot of correlations with death come from those uh, cholesterol measures, because they're driven out of this mess. Insulin, though, is what kind of symbolizes the whole mess. And that's actually called the insulin resistance syndrome. The great Dr. Raven died there last year, and he basically put this together. But you'll have heard of it as metabolic syndrome, but it's really insulin resistance syndrome all of that junk that's going on in there. There are other causes, though, because sometimes we get accused of saying, you know, you're jumping on this one as the big cause. Well, it is the big cause. But let's not forget that omega-3, 6 balance and too many vegetable oils independently drive problems. Suboptimum magnesium, certainly. Lack of UV, vitamin D, nitric oxide released in your skin. That's another cause if you're starved of the sun or the nutrition that can give you the alternatives. And we've got gut permeability, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, stress, smoking. Lots of causes that directly cause vascular distress. Interestingly, though, most of these things, and I have the papers, also drive up insulin and insulin resistance. 
So you can see how this whole nexus together is a massive causal hive of action, right? Pushing arterial disease and heart attacks. So at this stage, you'd probably say, wow, if you just focused on all of that good stuff, you, you'd be miles ahead of everyone else, and you'd be correct. There's even more, I won't get into it, but it's there for the YouTube. <laughs> but I didn't actually get to LDL yet, because that's where the world's focus was, mostly for the last 30, 40 years. And one of the reasons is, I left it out at the side a bit, is that insulin, when it's raised, drives atherogenic dyslipidemia, increased LDL particle counts, and can drive cholesterol synthesis inappropriately. So essentially, insulin gives LDL some of its pathological or predictive power. So it's kind of an interacting thing, though it does have its own causal pathways. So we won't forget it, because if your LDL shoots up when you change your diet, You've got to watch your LDL. It is an important measure. It's just relatively small on the scheme of things. So Pareto would be all over this like a rash, as we say in Ireland, for sure, the big stuff. And would be keeping an eye on that too to make sure it doesn't jump around in a questionable way. The sequence went there. But we go into the final part, so you can breathe a sigh of relief shortly. We're nearly done. Try to keep things simple and rack and stack. What are the top things to do if you get a high calcification score or you're worried about your longevity? Well, let's keep it simple. Here's one you really want to do. Do not have excess fructose, excess glucose, particularly refined carbohydrate in your diet. Take all of that out. Eat low carb, high fat, healthy fat. Here's a picture from diet doctor. There's nothing crazy about that diet. You take out all the starchy carbs and sugars. You eat above ground leafy vegetables, peppers, and all this stuff, and you have grass-fed meats and fish and eggs and avocado and olives, and I could go on and on. This is a lovely diet, and that's going to cover you for this risk. Um, you don't do refined carbohydrates. That's ridiculous, okay? Breads and all these processed carbohydrates. You don't do processed food. And again, later on this afternoon, there's going to be discussions on processed food. And the mechanisms are insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, inflammatory vectors, so many mechs, you know, so much science. Second thing, suboptimum omega-3 and excessive omega-6, generally through vegetable oil consumption in the last century, that's a problem. So you eat fish or you take cod liver oil for the omega-3, not too difficult. You certainly don't eat seed oils or industrially processed vegetable oils. That's just stupid, right? And processed food is stuffed with refined carbohydrate and vegetable oils, so processed food is just a default, don't do it. Uh, inflammatory vectors and cellular damage are more the mechanisms here compared to up here. Suboptimum magnesium, take your Brazil nuts. Magnesium citrate is cheap as $20 for a half kilogram, right? You can mix it with stews, with, with dinners for the family. That's what we do. We have, whole family gets magnesium. Make sure you're, uh, you, you're up to speed. It's estimated 80% of the population are now deficient or insufficient in magnesium and it's in 300 chemical reactions. The biochemistry is just completely compelling. This is a stupid thing to be low on. And no processed food, because sugars and processed food will deplete you of magnesium, like alcohol does. Last one, I would say healthy sun exposure, whether through lamps or if you need to, D-rich foods and nutrient-dense foods that have vitamin D. But the don't is don't burn, and again, don't eat processed foods, because that's a don't for every rule. <laughs> and that's biochemical basics. The sun is there for our evolution. It had a purpose, so um, ideally get some of it. And so on. You can move on down the Pareto. It depends on your risk tolerance and how much you want to stay alive, live long, thrive, be productive, be there for your grandkids and still be able to run up and down the road. It depends on how much you want to live long and strong. You can go down and fix a lot more things. But they're the top ones. They're the top ones. So bottom line and the final sequence. Middle-aged person, middle risk, not sure what their risk is, not sure if they have heart disease or they're really healthy, and concerned, you know. Get a calcification scan, five-minute scan. It's in the guidelines, US and uh, European guidelines, ESC. No one knows about it. There's political reasons it was suppressed, but it is in the guidelines now for heart disease. 
It's a simple test. If you get a really low score, like myself or Dr. Gerber, fine. Keep following the rules. You know, you were doing something good. Keep doing it. Uh, blood tests occasionally to check, is there an issue? That's fair enough. Not too much panic. And in five, seven, or eight years, you can get another scan, quick scan, and just verify you have not inappropriately risen in calcification. So you're still on the wagon, right? You haven't fallen off. Get a high score, like David. Okay, now you've got to take some action, because it's the most serious measurement that you can get. You will have to get into exploring what's wrong in your life to have caused that high score. And it will be different for different people. I mean, if you were the last 30 years drinking Coca-Cola, eating pits or pizzas and watching Netflix, right, sitting on your ass, you can probably guess why you got that score. But what if you were like David and you were fit, running regularly and slim, didn't smoke? Now, David, of course, was on a very high-carb diet, you know, and he, he went diabetic, and that's what destroyed his arteries, what destroys most people's arteries. So anyway, if you get a high score, you need to look at a lot of blood measures I can't go into here. You may need medications. There's a lot of anti-medication fervor at the moment about statins, but there's a stabilizing effect on atherosclerosis, and someone with a high score may need to belt and braces uh, to be sure they're safe. And maybe after a couple of years, you can reconsider the medications, depending on your level of knowledge and how your calcification is progressing. You certainly follow the basic rules, and you probably move on down the Pareto, right? Because if you have a high score, you need to make sure you cover every single risk. Some people could have heavy metal contamination. You know, heavy metals are being acknowledged now for the first time two months ago. Lead, over the 60s, 70s, and 80s, is being acknowledged to have caused huge numbers of heart attacks. But it's only coming out now. So there's lots of special causes. And if you are a diabetic person with damaged metabolism, even though grass-fed healthy fats and grass-fed meats are healthy for most people, there's some evidence that for some APOE4 genotypes who have got metabolic dysfunction, they may be quite sensitive to intensive protein and fat from animal products. So they, there may be an exception there that need a, a special check, right? So it, it gets like, it's a big investigation when you have big disease because it's your life, right? And if you don't do the investigation, no one else will. Trust me, no one did for David. He would have hit the wall. No one would have helped him when he was lucky enough to do it himself. And maybe a couple of years later, for a severely diseased person, you'd want to check and make sure that the actions you took in here are working and that your score has stopped rising. And if it stops rising and stabilized, like David's for the last six years, your risk drops largely to someone who never had a score in the first place. So there's huge hope here. If you stop your progression, your risk plummets back down to someone who didn't have a score in the first place, which is cool. So, if you did all of that, as I described, you would be like an engineer following Pareto, the principle. But if you want to eat your healthy whole grains and your heart-healthy vegetable oils, right, and you want to just use standard tests for heart disease but not get a proper one like the calcification scan, if you want to go that way, well, you've got a guy to follow. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.